I sent out a text. I don't know how many of you got it. Uh, some of you may have said, Pastor, Pastor, did you know what time it was? <laughs> I thought it was an hour earlier. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> so, however, I will say this. Not about all of you, but many of you, younger people especially, I get texts all hours of the night. <laughs> and my children. Okay, so I, I, I considered turning my phone off, but then I come under such deep conviction that I couldn't sleep, so I turn it back on again, just in case something were to happen. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I didn't feel extremely bad uh, about sending that out after I realized what time it was. So just wanted to give you just a little, I, I just felt like, you know, giving you a little something to sleep on or dream on or rest on. But I want to take a look uh, at... Uh, uh, Isaiah 54 this morning. It's kind of been in my heart for the last few weeks. Who knows what time it is? Okay, thank you. Because she knows I can't even see back there, let alone the clock right now without my glasses. But time is not just measured in seconds and minutes and hours. The Bible speaks about time way more often about seasons than it does about the time on a, on, a, uh, on a clock or on a calendar or on a sundial or whatever it is that's been used throughout the ages. It's very important that we know the time. Read the script, look up, to, get, get in your concordance and, and, uh, or your Blue Letter Bible app and just sometimes take a word, like the word time, and look and see how it is used uh, in scripture talking about time there's a few verses you hear from me quite often the sons of Issachar they knew the time and what Israel ought to do they knew the time that they were living in it was a defined time of purpose it wasn't something that they knew what the calendar month was we know that all we have to do is look at our calendar it wasn't about what time of day it was. All we need to do is look at our clocks. But what it was was about the time in the history of Israel that the sons of Issachar were functioning at that time, and they were able to understand that time. I know I ministered a little bit on this subject at the beginning of COVID when things were happening that were so you know, out of whack for us. Uh, there became a new normal for that season. And I really felt that there's, this is a time in God. God is never confused. God is never trying to catch up with what's going on. God is well aware of every moment and every season way in advance. Another scripture was that we really built on back at that time in Esther 4.14. How do you know that you have not been brought into the kingdom for such a time as this? Clearly that wasn't the time on a clock. Clearly that wasn't just the month of the year. But it was a season and a time where the nation of Israel and their existence was weighed in the balance. If Haman would have got away with what he had intended to do and what he thought he had all set in motion, there would be no Israel, there would be no Savior, and we would not have any purpose to be here today. But she was brought into the kingdom for such a time as this. These times that I'm referring to are God's times and God's seasons. Ecclesiastes 3.1, I just want to read this section of scripture. I didn't give it to those that have the PowerPoint today, so you can just bear with me or whatever you want to do. But, and I did have it right here, but it disappeared on me, so now I've got to find it again. To everything, there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. So clearly we're not talking about, oh, this is just a time of difficulty. Oh, this is just the time of, 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 of uh, you know, the devil's doing this and that. There's a time for every purpose under heaven. God has a purpose in every time and every season that we go through. There's a purpose for winter. There's a purpose 
for the fall and the spring. There's a purpose for sowing. It goes on here to say there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. There's a time to plant and there's a time to pluck what is planted. In other words, there's harvest. We know there's a planting time. We know that spring in the northeast, springtime is typically planting time. It's not harvest time, but what you plant in the spring, some things come through a quicker harvest. Some things will manifest a harvest in June. It's been strawberry season, and I grew up in a home that every June, May, June, we went to Sheltices. We went wherever it was. We went to Atlanta, not Georgia, but over there, that little burg near North Cohocton when they grew strawberries. And when I was a little kid, I came along for the ride. And I found a little place in the, in the row, and I'd sit down there, and I'd pluck the strawberries and put on about 12 pounds before I came home. I'd bring my little basket and say, Mom, look what I did. And she'd be very proud of me. But anyhow, We'd pick 60, 70, 80, 100 quarts and bring them home and make freezer jam and all that. There was a time every year that I looked forward to that. There's another harvest that comes, of course, in the fall when there are certain things that are harvested in the fall and apple season and all that kind of stuff. So we know that in the natural, but we've got to understand that the one who created the natural did it from a point of view of the spiritual. And that the Bible says, as it goes the natural, so goes the spiritual. So not only that, but there's things to learn from that as we study nature and the God of nature and how he set things up for us. So there's a time to plant, but then there's a time to harvest. You don't want to be planting during harvest time or you'll miss the harvest. You don't want to be looking to harvest during planting time or you're not going to get anything. We understand that today. There's a time to kill and a time to heal. Some people don't like to hear that, but it's in the word of God. There's a time to break down and there's a time to build up. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh. Time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. Time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. So the Lord makes it very clear that there are times and seasons and that we need to, as believers, understand the times. The world today thinks they know everything. We were all there once. And so they're always telling us about how things really are. Of course, we've heard a word as of late, the last few years, a lot of the word science. We follow the science. It's about the science. We know. Well, God makes it very clear that he created science. And he said any science that is inconsistent with his word, I'm paraphrasing it here, but it's very clearly in the scripture, is not science at all. But we're hearing all of these things about this is going to happen then. And oh my gosh, for those, the, the longer you've been around, a crisis was coming around the corner. You know, by the time when I was 30 or whatever it was, or 40, I can't even remember right now what was going to stop functioning, what was going to, you know, be broken, how the world was going to come to an end. And so the world is always promoting, and with social media today, it's on the increase. It's, we're bombarded with it. I don't believe that believers should not have any connection with social media. That's entirely up to you, but I do utilize it. I like to know what's being said and what's going on, but I don't believe everything that I hear that's said. And so we need to know, my whole point here before I even get started, is that we need to know the time that we're living in. We need to be like the sons of Issachar that know the time, because when we know the time, then we'll know what we ought to do. The church should not be confused about what we're here to do. The church should not be confused about the time and season that we are in. We shouldn't be trying to sow when God's saying it's time to harvest. We need to be mindful of what God says this time is. And the only one that can communicate that to us is the Lord by the Holy Spirit. Of course, his word becomes significant. And as we look at this section of scripture this morning, I want to, I want, I want to do a couple things as we look at it this morning. I want to talk a little bit about... Um, uh, about the ministry of the prophet, which we know that the vast majority of the scriptures really are penned by prophets. 
There are even those that are called prophets that we don't see a prophecy per se, and yet they're called a prophet, which tells me that their words are prophetic. The chapters of their letter are prophetic. What does it mean that they're prophetic? Well, when prophets speak, they speak to a specific time and a specific place, but what they say carries over into other times and other places. Otherwise, we would just look at the Bible, and that's what a lot of people do today when they look at it from a simple, reasonable standpoint, is they say, well, that's an old book. What they're really saying is, what's that got to do with now? What does that have to do with this time? Look at the technology we have in this time. Look at all the things that are here that we deal with in this time. That's old. Man, we just need up-to-date information. But because the Bible is the Word of God, and it is for all times, we simply need to learn how to interpret scripture that was written thousands of years ago and how it applies to today, right now, in my life. Because it does. Because it is truth. It's not just truth for a time. It's truth for all time. God's able to do that. And so therefore the Bible, when you open it up and read in it and you pray and you ask God to speak to you, whether you're you know, just opening it up for the day and saying, Lord, you know, give me a word of wisdom or whether you're looking for something in particular and saying, God, I need an answer on this subject. Why, as, we, as we dig into the word and as we study and as we seek wisdom and counsel from the word of God, we find answers that are pertinent to today. We find things that change our life. We find things that change people's lives that could not be changed any other way because of the power of the Word of God, because of the power of truth, and because God's Word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But when we go to interpret, because the Scriptures say that no Scripture is of any private interpretation, we need to hear what it is that God was saying. So when I read in Isaiah 54, for instance, only as an example this morning, God's saying something to us today. But if we don't know the time and the season that we're living in, we're not, and, and, if, and if we don't interpret Scripture properly by using Scripture, God gave us a means of a code of interpretation right within the Word itself. What was that, that they, in World War II? What is it called? The Enigma? Okay, It was what the Germans used, a system of communication, that it took years for the, for the Allies to break that code. And it was like a typewriter, but it wasn't with letters like we would see today, and which is really where we get the word, that's an enigma. <laughs> but there was a code, and there was a means of understanding it. The Bible is that book for us. It's not meant to be an enigma in that we are lost in an outer space trying to figure it out. The problem is, is when we often try to figure it out and not just let it explain itself. But we need to understand that God's word was given to us also, as he says in the parable, that there was a treasure in the field. And when the person, the man, found that there was a treasure in that field, he went and bought the field. And he began to dig. And it says, and he began to dig deep. See, God wants us to dig in his word. It's not going to just sit on float on the surface for us because he wants me to learn to seek him. He wants me to learn to study to show myself approved unto God. He wants me to learn to look into the word. He wants me to learn to use the tools that are available today that are so amazing for us to be able to search the scriptures in ways that others throughout history couldn't do. I mean, when the, when the first written concordance came up, it was so awesome to have our Bible and our Strong's concordance there to be able to study the word. And if I wanted to look up a word, I could look it up just like in a dictionary. I could find the word time, and I could find all the definitions in the Greek and the Hebrew. It was an amazing thing, but now that's all on my phone. Now I just push a few buttons to find that information. Man, we've got everything we need today to study the Word of God, to find out what is God saying about this time and this season, and what I ought to be doing. But we've got to be faithful to do our part. We've got to be faithful to be obedient to God's Word. So the prophet speaks to yesterday, and he speaks to today. The second thing is types and symbols. So I want to comment on that for just a minute. We interpret Scripture through types and symbols. We're going, to, we're going to look today at Scriptures that tell us that we need to enlarge our tent. How many of you live in a tent? Probably none of us do. 
I saw that hand. <laughs> Did you? Praise the Lord. January, you're going to be sleeping in that thing. <laughs> so we can look at that and people will say, my gosh, I don't live in a tent. What does this verse have to do with me? It has to do with those people back then that wandered around in tents, but I've got my home and it's in a secure place and it's a consistent place and so therefore this verse doesn't apply to me. Well, no, we need to interpret what's being said by what has already been said. We need to interpret Scripture with Scripture, and I'll show you what I mean by that in just a moment when we get into it. So I'm just giving a little preclusion uh, uh, instruction here before we get in and look at that verse, just to help you as you study the Word of God, as you read Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, and sometimes feel lost. I'm trying to give you a little guidance as to how to interpret Scripture, how to find out what's being said for you today as you read those verses that technically are a thousand years old, but are really brand new each and every day. So what I want to do is read uh, Isaiah 54. I want to read the first eight verses, but we're only going to look at the first three. One of the reasons I'm looking at the first eight is because context is important too. We've got to be very careful when we pull a scripture out of some place and don't look at the context of it. A lot of times we can misinterpret what's being said simply because we don't look at the verses before and after. Somebody says something to you, they use a sentence, they use a word, and you miss what they said five minutes before and five minutes after, you're probably going to miss what they were talking about. So let's read Isaiah 54, 1 through 8. It says, Sing, O barren, you who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall expand to the right and to the left and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. Do not fear for you will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced for you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, he's called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were refused, says your God. For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on you says the Lord, your Redeemer. Once again, I want to look at the first three. I'm just going to reread those before I continue on. Sing, O barren, you who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare Lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, for you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. First of all, as he begins this, he says, Sing, O barren. Sing, O barren. What's the significance of that? You may be in here and be a, a man and say, Well, I, uh, can't be speaking to me because... I'm not of the gender that's able to bear children. You may be here and be a woman and not be married or not have had any children. Your children may have grown up, but let's say you haven't had any, and, uh, uh, and, and yet you're saying, well, gee, this, talking about children here, I'm not, what's this got to do with me? When he's talking about barren, he's talking about what we simply would all know, not producing offspring, Okay. But as we get into this a little bit more, we're going to see that he's not speaking to an individual person. He's not even speaking to the female gender. Okay, He's speaking today, well, he's speaking to Israel, but he's speaking today to the church. He's speaking to the body of Christ. When the Bible talks about reproduction within the facet of the church, he's talking about bringing people into the kingdom. He's talking about people being born again, becoming part of the household of faith, becoming part of the family of God. 
So he's referring here, it could refer to many different situations. We're actually going to look at one specifically from Scripture. I'm not going to take a lot of time on it. You'll probably be familiar with it yourself, but an actual example of this right in the Old Testament, and there are many, to be honest with you. You who have not labored with child. I'm going to, as I go a little further, I'll come back and keep tying things in to a little bit more. He talks about the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman in verse 1. What's he referring to when he's talking about the married woman versus the desolate? Well, to be married is not to live together. To be married is to what? Is to enter into a covenant relationship. Marriage is a covenant relationship. It's two people coming together and making covenant with one another. As believers, we make that covenant as well with the Lord. So once again, what people are on earth today that are in covenant with the Lord? The church is in covenant with the Lord. So we, in essence, are the married woman. What are we called in Scripture? We're called the what? The bride of Christ, correct? At the end of the book of Revelation... 21, 2, and, and 9. It says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 9, Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. There's a whole other factor we could throw in there. The lamb's wife. What do you mean the lamb? I'm not a lamb's wife. Who's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? Who did John say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now I'm interpreting Scripture, right? Now I'm interpreting Isaiah 54, but I'm interpreting it with New Testament, not just New Testament, but with Scripture itself. So I know we're talking about the Lamb's wife, so we're talking about the Bride of Christ, so we're talking about the church, so he's referring to the church and he's saying, you who have not born children. We're talking about the church that, I thank God for the church, I thank God for our church, I thank God for new people who come to the church, but I'm telling you what, we have watched thousands and thousands and thousands of people come through our community that, as far as I know, never came to Christ. I'm not saying that to bring condemnation on anybody, I'm not saying that to bring judgment, I'm just saying I don't believe that the church myself included, has been as productive in the area of being reproductive as God wants us to be when the time comes. So we know, I happen to be born again, Ernie and I have talked, you, you also, in a time when reproduction was taking place. For those of you that weren't there or haven't been someplace where that was taking place, you, you, it's hard to know what I'm talking about experientially. When droves of people were coming to Christ, young people in our case, I wasn't paying attention to the old folks. I was 19. I was living here in this community. We were watching people around the globe coming to Jesus. People that were messed up like myself. People who had no inkling of God whatsoever, had no desire to know God whatsoever. None of that was there, but there was such a It was a time that the Holy Spirit was moving that was, it was a time of harvest. Okay, it was a time of harvest. You know, when the time of harvest comes, when we look in the apple orchard out here, uh, blossoms will come and apples will grow and develop and apples will mature and apples will turn red and it'll be October somewhere in that time. And guess what? You and I had nothing to do with that. Jerry and Dottie Snyder had nothing to do with that. It happened in its time. And harvest is not dependent upon you and I wanting to see people get saved. Otherwise, we'd be in a constant time of harvest. Because we want to see people saved. We've got family members we want to see saved. We've got people at work we want to see saved. And there will be those that will come through any time and any season. There's, there's always something being productive, but then there's the time of harvest. And I believe that we are entering into a time of harvest that I have not seen in almost 40 years. I've seen people get saved. 
I see people in the church right now that were saved and came to Christ over these last years, these last 40 years. Coming to a Bible study, coming to church, having a conflict in your life, whatever it might be, and coming to Jesus. And I rejoice in that always as I look around the church and try to remember, gee, when were they, when were, when were they a student at Alfred State? Was it Alfred State or was it Alfred University? I can't remember. Were we in the campus center or were we in SLC or were we in, you know, I try to figure these things out sometimes in my mind and I'm very thankful for it. But I know that we have, that, that, that there's been many more that, needed to get harvested, but it wasn't the time. In a time of harvest, everybody's not going to get saved. But in a time of harvest, there is a, everything you pluck, every tree is not going to produce 100%. Every, every apple you get is not going to, you know, not have a bad spot in it or a wormhole or whatever. But in a time of harvest, we find that that's where there's an enlargement. That's, there's an increase. And in some cases, you know that you didn't do anything. One plants, one waters, God brings the increase. It's an amazing thing, but we need to know when that time is because when the harvest is great, we don't want the laborers to be few. Right? Man, it's in harvest time that if anybody's going to show up, you want them to show up at harvest time. We want the church to be in a harvesting mentality when God's in a harvesting time. And not have us looking someplace else or waiting for something when God says, don't wait. The fields are ripe for harvest. There's something in me, and I believe it's the Holy Spirit, that is quickening. I'll use this word just because most of us know what it stands for, but I'm not trying to reduce what I'm sensing to a method, but it's the word evangelism. For many, many years, I, by nature, I'm a teacher. I'm not an evangelist. For many, many years, I have not sensed and felt and seen what was happening when I came into the kingdom personally. And teaching is important. And pastoring is important. And apostles and prophets are important. And we certainly, by all means, are not all called in the office of an evangelist. But oh, what it, what it is when a time of harvest comes. And you really don't even know if you did anything about it. It might even come at a time that you're struggling in your life, and yet all of a sudden you're leading people to Jesus. They're almost knocking on your door, and you feel so insufficient for the moment. What did I do to deserve this in a good way? And yet it's harvest time. We can't really explain it. Why did I go to Houghton College? Why did I go over there to hear the gospel preached when I was wasted the night before and really should have been sleeping or my eyes had start to open about 7 o'clock at night for other things? How did I end up over there? How did I end up sitting in there in a night when the gospel was preached to me and I gave my life to Christ? What broke me that night? What caused me to be like, oh my gosh, where did this all come from? It was a time of harvest. It was a time of harvest. I, I, I feel so strongly that we are entering in, even as we are here together today, into a harvest time. I'm hearing it. I'm hearing it in churches that I go to. I'm hearing it on things online. I'm hearing people. There's a, there's a harvesting emphasis. And I don't know if it's because some people think that they're just uh, you know what, I haven't talked about evangelism in a long time. Let's, let's use that as a theme. I don't think that's it. I think it's the Holy Ghost is putting it in our hearts to get ready, but to realize there's something to do as we look at this scripture and look at a little bit more of it. He talks in there about the, uh, he says, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman. So he's comparing this married woman, he's comparing this barren woman to someone who is very productive when it comes to reproduction, talking in the natural here. And the clearest example that came to me was Sarai, Abraham's wife Sarah, okay, and Hagar. Sarah was in covenant relationship as the wife of Abraham. Hagar was not. She was an Egyptian. Egypt always represents the world in the Bible. 
Look at it over and over. When you see Egypt, you're looking at the world. And he's saying that the desolate, the world will always have more followers. The world will always reproduce more of what it's into. Don't get caught up in numbers. Because this is one of the things that's happened in the church over the years, is rather than revival, rather than having children, it's been about church growth. It's been about having more people in the service than we had last week. And I believe God wants there to be more people because he wants there to be more children. He wants there to be more salvations. He wants people to become born again and that to fill the house. But if we're not careful, we will put our focus on quantity rather than quality. And we'll think that if we can just get them to come to church. And I tell you today, don't try to get people to come to church. Get people saved. When people get saved, they'll come to God's house. But people can come to God's house because of our technology. We can begin to implement those things that are attractive to a particular generation and a particular time and season, and there can be an, a, a false harvest almost. We can even get people that will come to an altar and profess something, and yet their life has not been impacted by the gospel and by the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that we should sit back and judge whether that person really got saved or not. That's not my job. But I do know this, we, we need to keep the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to keep the cross of Jesus Christ. We need to keep the reality of the full gospel. Not that just God loves you and wants to bless you and wants to give you everything that you want. Man, if somebody told me that, I'd sure come to that type of a thing. But it's not the truth. It is the truth, but it's not the truth. Okay, there's, a, there, there's what God wants to do in your and my life, but when I define greatness differently than God defines greatness, then I'm going to be looking for something that God never said he was going to do. And so we have to be careful that we don't look to the desolate woman because she has a lot of children. We don't want to look to the methods that the world has for filling coliseums or even some churches but we need to keep it. They may be fewer, but they're truly going to be children of the king. He says to sing and cry. Sing, O barren, you who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. I had to ask the Lord. I said, Lord, what does that mean? It could mean that we need to praise God in everything. And everything give thanks, for the, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. When there doesn't seem to be the, the production that I'm looking for, when it's not happening the way that I would like to have it happen, I need to rejoice and thank God during those seasons, during, during those times. But I, I wasn't convinced that that was really what was in the forefront of my heart. I, I believe that's an accurate biblical interpretation. And there'll be times that the Holy Spirit just gives you interpretation of a scripture, maybe just for you personally, that might be different than a sermon that you heard. Don't discredit that. Don't say, well, that can't be right because that's not what pastor said the other day. Keep in mind, God can speak anything at any time through his word to you. That's why we need to learn to hear his voice. But I really felt that when he talked here about singing and crying out, that he was talking about evangelism and intercession. Evangelism and intercession. What did Hannah do when she was barren? She prayed. She didn't just say a prayer. She went and she prayed. She gave herself to intercession. She gave herself. Sarah gave herself to intercession. Gave herself to prayer. I believe that the church that is not interceding and praying for the lost is probably not going to experience much of a harvest. Prayer is critical. Crying, excuse me, crying out to God is critical because you and I don't save anybody. Jesus saved everybody, but everybody's not saved. So if Jesus saved everybody and everybody's not saved, what's the difference between the saved and the unsaved? It's, it's having a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's having the eyes of their understanding enlightened in the knowledge of him. How does that happen? Who's the enlightener? It's God. 
I drove with people in a vehicle to get to Houghton College, but they didn't have anything to do with me getting saved that night. They just got me there. It was the apprehension of God into an addict's life and one who was blinded by their own sin that caused an awakening to take place in the very depth of my heart and a desire to repent and make changes in my life. That was the Holy Spirit. Sing and cry aloud, intercession, along with evangelism. Psalm 32 talks about songs of deliverance. There are times when my song becomes a song of deliverance. My song isn't just always a song of praise. It isn't always a song of worship. Sometimes it's just a cry. David said, I cried to the Lord, and he heard my cry. You know, sometimes, sometimes it's a song, but it's not a happy song. It's not a sad song. It's a song that's around a weight in my life. Oh, God, God, come. God, I need you. God, change this circumstance. God, change my, my life. It's a time that we come to the end of ourselves. It's when the prodigal son comes to his senses and he says, what am I doing here, man? I'm going back to dad's house. I don't know if he had a song on the way back. It doesn't say that he did, but if he did, it was a song of deliverance, I believe. It was a song that, oh my gosh, I need to get set free from where I have been in the blindness of my mind and my heart. And I need to come back to father. Psalm 40, verse 1 and 3. Through three, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me, and he heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. I believe there's songs of deliverance. I, I, I believe there's songs of evangelism. So we don't want to lock into just songs that are either praise or worship or whatever, but that God wants us, he wants the barren woman who has really been the church for many years at this point in time. Once again, that's just a, that's just a reality. We don't need to, well, gee, I, I brought a couple people to Jesus. I've been trying to share with people, but I, man, was pastor upset with us this morning? No, it's, it's not the point. The point is, is we need to cry out to the Lord. My prayers need to reflect my burden for the lost and not just, God, I need something by the end of this week. And I remember back in the day after getting saved is a number of us who were just getting saved. We didn't know the Bible. We didn't know the books of the Bible. We didn't know any of that. But there, just, there was a burden for the lost. There was just such a strong desire to go and to begin to tell people about Jesus. I went to some places that I can't even believe I did it today. I can't believe I went to those folks and told them about Christ. Yeah. Makes me a little shaky just to think about it right now. But I went to prayer. We were at the Seventh-day Baptist Church, and there was a little office in there that, I don't know what it used to be. You've got to realize that building was there from 1806 or something like that. David, back in that day, 1836, you're the historian. And there was a closet in there, if you remember. There was a coat closet which got made into an office, but then there was a closet underneath the stairs that brought you right to the, the, the stone foundation. One side was on the outside, and one, one was on the inside. That was, this is pre-blue board insulation, blown-in insulation, all that kind of stuff day. And so when we would crawl in there, you had to crawl in that closet because it went under the stairs. When we would crawl in there for prayer at 5, 5.30 in the morning, we just went in there and cried to God and said, God, save people. I want to see people get saved. And then we'd come out a few hours later and see what God had for the day. And people would get saved often. It wasn't a massive revival, but it was regular. Because there was a cry that God had put in. I'm a selfish person. Okay, first of all, I don't like getting up at 5.30. Second of all, I don't like going laying against the wall in the wintertime where there's, it's got ice on the inside of it. None of this was by nature me the person. But I was compelled to do it. And as we did, 
people would get saved. There were some people that I went and shared the gospel with that laughed, and they're still laughing today. And I had a sense they were going to do that. But I had to go. I knew that if I didn't, I would be being disobedient to God. One of them was a vice president at Alfred State College back in that day. And I went up and knocked on his door, and I was petrified. Here he has it all together, and here am I. And the only reason I knew him personally is because when he was a student at Alfred State College, he, he, he was in a, a, a house. He rented a house with my brother. And so he knew who I was, although I was quite a few years younger. But I knocked on his door, and he came to the door. I was really hoping that he wouldn't come to the door. But I'd already prayed, and I know God said to go see him. And I knocked on the door. I said, hey. He goes, hey, Roger, what's up? I said, well, I just came here to tell you that Jesus loves you. And I said, and he told me in prayer this morning to come say that to you. He goes, God told you to come to me and tell me that Jesus loved me? I said, yep. He says, all right. Anything else? I said, nope. <laughs> Closed the door. I don't know if I've had a conversation with him since that time. <clears throat> Seen him many times. I don't know where he'll be when Jesus comes back. Maybe he'll remember that day. Maybe that'll become significant. Those are the kind of things that were going on. I don't want to take all day to share testimonies. I believe we're coming into a time like this. God's going to begin to speak to you. Your prayers are going to start to be a little different. They're not going to be just praying for you, but they're going to be praying for somebody else. It's not just going to be a, uh, a quick little throwing something out there, but you're going to find yourself as if you're, let's go back to this scripture, as if you're laboring with child. Those of women in here that have had children, and there are some that are very close, it's called labor for a purpose. And the labor doesn't just begin as the child enters the birth canal, but that's when it gets the toughest. There's a laboring. It's a position that Elijah got in when he went up on Mount Carmel and went up and looked for rain to come. The Bible actually says that he was in a birthing position of prayer. That's intercession. There's a difference between intercession and saying a prayer. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with letting our requests be made known unto God. We're told in Philippians to do that. But I'm saying intercession is something different. Intercession is when I go until something is born. Something is born. And what is going to be born is what God has put in you, in you to be born. It might be an individual. It might be a relative. It might be whatever, whoever, whenever, however. But you will find yourself literally, Paul said that I, as he prayed, he, he, he labored in prayer until Christ be formed in them. And that's really what we're asking God to do is to form himself in these people like he did us. Coming in. Okay, being born again is Christ coming in you. That's not just a, yeah, you know, I got saved and they said that Christ came in me. Let me tell you something. If, you're, if you believe Christ is in you because they said it, he probably isn't. Because when God comes inside of you, that doesn't mean you're perfect and sinless, but you know God's in there now. Changes everything. Verse 2. There are four things in here you might want to jot down because this is kind of the bulk of things, and then I'll end with verse 3 very quickly. In verse 2, he talks about, enlarge the place of your tent. What is your tent? Your tent is your life. It's not talking about the dwelling. You may live in a motor home. You may live in a mobile home. You may live in a, 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 a skyscraper. You may live in a condo. You may live in whatever. He's not talking about that. He was referring now to Israel, and he had something specific that he was speaking to Israel prophetically in that day and that hour. But why did God choose to leave it in the book? It's for us today. He says it's time to enlarge your tent. And I want to say that to every one of us. It is time to enlarge your tent. It's your life. Enlarge the place of your tent. 2 Corinthians 5.1 For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, 
is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, <clears throat> eternal in the heavens. If you look at that scripture in context, he's talking about their, their, their bodies. Okay? Your house, your tent. If it's destroyed, which we know it will be, we have a building, right? We have a glorified body. We have a new tent from God made with hands eternal in the heavens. So what's he saying here? He says, I want you to enlarge the place of your tent. I want you to enlarge the place of your life. I said, God, give me wisdom on this for me as well as the church. He said, tell the church that number, this, this is the number one, I want you to go places that normally and by habit you wouldn't go. I want you to begin to expand your life and your thinking each and every day about the boundaries that you have in your life. I fellowship with these people. I spend time with these folks here. <clears throat> it might be the lighthouse as your church, but within that framework, there's four or five people that you tend to, you know, if you're going to go hang out or if something's going to be done, they're going to call me, we're going to call them. And that group, of course, we have life groups today and so on. They all have purpose. They're all important. But what I want to say to you is this. God's saying, if you want to start having children, you need to start going places you've not gone before. You need to start going into places that are not common for you to go to. We cannot be afraid of going and... Re We're not going to reach the world if we don't connect with the world. We're not going to connect with the world if we don't go where the world is. And we need to be mature enough not to go be with the world and to act like them. Okay, that's going to fit into my fourth point this morning. But he says, I want you to begin to enlarge the place of your tent. I want you to begin to expand the kind of places that you might go to. The kind of people you might spend time with. Oh, it could be, it, it can be one of a gazillion things. There might be people who never went to their, their, re, their, their, their high school reunion. To be honest with you, I can't stand my high school reunion. Okay? Because I'm reuni reuniting with people that I am not there anymore. At all. And for years I said, I don't want to go there because I'm going to go there and I'm going to start saying things and they're going to throw me out. So I said, I might as well just not go in the first place. But the reality is, is that God wants us to go and be with folks like Jesus did. I mean, did he ever run from a situation? Did he ever freak out at something? No, he went and hung out with the sinners and the religious folks are like, man, you're hanging out with sinners. Yeah. Yeah, I'm called to seek and save the lost. What do you want me to do? Hang around with the religious people all the time? But at the same time, of course, they called him a wine bibber and they called him this and that and something else. At the same time, he still knew no sin. He didn't participate in the things that they would do that were of a compromising sinful nature. You know, not everything that a sinner does is sin. You know that. All right, when they lick their ice cream cone, <laughs> there's not something sinful about that. You see the way they lick that thing? Unfortunately, sometimes the church is that way. Did you see the way they pumped their gas? Did you see the way they did it? It's like, my gosh, what's wrong with us? Hang out with people. I went home yesterday. I'd already prepared this, but my wife blessed me. I haven't even said anything to her yet. <clears throat> we had prayer here. I had a couple meetings. Afterwards, I went home. I don't know what time it was. It might have been two or whatever. And I walked to the back deck that we have back there. And Penny was sitting there. And as I went around the corner, up came our neighbor, Kathy, trucking along the back lawn. Penny had just sent her a text and said, why don't you come up and hang out in my back lawn on the deck for a while? And so I had a project going on in the garage that took me an hour and a half. And just as I finished it, Kathy went back home again. They've been our neighbors for 35 years. We've had interaction. We've taken each other things at Christmas time, all that kind of stuff. But how often have we said, hey, you guys want to come hang out? Because that's what happened yesterday. They hung out. 
talked about the kids, talked about their I mean, their kids were born there. Our kids were little and grew up there. and Just talked about life. That's all. Just talked about life. But like Penny says, I don't ever talk about life that I don't talk about Jesus because he's my life. So there's no, okay, where did I fit the gospel in there? Well, about 20 minutes into it, I said, okay, right here. Get away from that stuff. If you are saved and full of the Holy Spirit, can you tell me that the light in you is not going to shine through your life? And so they spent time together, they laughed together, stuff happened. And, uh, you know, the same with our neighbors up the road are, are older and are going through some physical things. And, and uh, you know, we've been, Penny really more than myself, but been mowing their lawn now and then and stopping in to see things and so on. I, I just use that as an example. You've only got so much time in a day, but start to, start to enlarge your tent a little bit. Start to expand, if you haven't, maybe some of you already are, but expand where it is that you dwell. Oh, they don't look like me. Oh, they don't eat like me. Oh, they don't think like me. Oh, they're a different... Man, just jump in. Jump in. Have them over to the house. Start getting a hold of... Hey, that was an all-the-time thing in our families, Penny's family. That's just the way they functioned. But how about, you know, you might even get a weird response. You, you, you want me to come to your house? For what? Well... Let's get something to eat. What do you like to eat? And we'll hang out, and then we'll whatever. But I'll tell you what, those are the things the world is not doing today. And those are the things that the heart of man and woman hungers for more than anything else. I just read the verse this morning that God has put eternity in every man and woman's heart. Everybody has a desire, has a thought, has a wish, has a hope to know about eternity, especially every time someone passes away. Wow. I wonder, where are they now anyhow? What's, you know, what's, wh why, who, why do you care? Because God has put eternity in everybody's heart. And if we know how eternity is going to work, then we have within us the answer to every man and woman's heart question. You just got to let God process the time before it gets set into place. But if we're always just hanging out with each other, there's something comforting about that. There's no stress when I hang out with another brother. Well, we know that's not true, but anyhow, it's, minim it's, it's minimized. At least when we talk about what's going on in the government, we probably are in agreement with one another, but that's not always true either. But anyhow, man, get out there. Get, get to know the people you work with. Don't let them just have a name tag. You're, you're, no, what's your name? No, man. Get to know them. Get to know their family. Find out about them. The, the second one, stretch out your curtains. Okay, he says enlarge the place of your tent. But now he says stretch out your curtains. What is a curtain? It's a portable wall or divider. The purpose of a curtain is it's a boundary. Okay, it's a boundary. When you're in the shower and you pull the shower curtain, you want it to be a visual boundary between you and what's on the other side of the curtain. Some people, when they shut the door of the bathroom, that's good enough, not at the gardener house. <laughs> and so the curtain is very significant. It's a boundary. It's a visible mark designating a limit. It designates a limit. There's the curtain. It's like a, it's a, it's a, it's a portable wall. Think about the tabernacle. It was all made of curtains. Curtains around the outside, curtains around the top, the curtains that covered the Ark of the Covenant, the curtains that separated the holy place from the holy of holies and the holy place from the outer court. It was all curtains. And all those curtains had a purpose, and that was to separate what was on one side from what was on the other. And we have boundaries in our life, and we need to have boundaries in our life. There need to be places we won't go and things we won't do. But on the other hand, there needs to be, sometimes we need to pull the curtains down so we can go someplace I haven't been that I need to be. He says, stretch out your curtains. Step outside. This is number two. Step outside of your comfort zone. 
We're comfortable in certain places. We, we get comfortable. People have come to the lighthouse, the praise, worship stuff going on, and it's kind of like, oh my gosh. But you know, they, if they keep coming, if they got overwhelmed by the fellowship, we had a, a, a guy that was here a couple weeks ago, came from work where Chris and those guys work that Jack had invited because he was preaching. And, uh, you know, then Jack invite, uh, introduces him to me just before the service. And he says this, I think his name was Norman. He says, this is Norman, this is Pastor Roger. And uh, he goes, oh my gosh. He says, I didn't expect this. And the service hadn't even started yet. <laughs> but he'd got hugged 14 times from there to get up to here. Hey, how you doing? Greetings. Glad you're here today. I mean, he's used to coming into a place. You go, you sit down, you're new, nobody bothers you, you don't bother anybody, and that's the name of that tune. But that's that, that, that kind of, and if you come and you keep coming, next thing you do, know, that becomes comfortable. You're okay with that. You bring somebody new and they go, oh my gosh, what's going on here? You say, uh, just hang in there, it's fine. Everything's okay. The one who almost didn't come back again. So we have our comfort places, but then the Lord's saying today to the church, but I want you to go out there, and I want you to get involved with things out there. Connect with folks out there. Step outside your comfort zone. Habakkuk 3.7, I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian trembled. You know that there were not curtains around the land of Midian, right? Okay, so what's he talking about? He's talking about their boundaries. Their boundaries. We have boundaries in our life. Like I said, not all boundaries are bad boundaries. But I think because when you come into the church, we come in and God begins to work in our life and I begin to get set free from things and I mean, repentance and ex God exposes things and so on and so forth and my life begins to align with the Word of God more and, 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 and we establish relationships, we establish boundaries. People will even tell us sometimes, you know, you probably shouldn't go there anymore. You probably shouldn't be part of that anymore. And there's a time in my life that that's absolutely true. There was a time in my life that if I went back to the bar again, I'd have been in trouble. I'm not moved like that today. I can go, not that I go and hang out at the bar all the time, but I know that I can go there and I'm not going to come home three sheets to the wind. If God wants me to go there, I went down to get a pizza at the Old Mill Inn not too long ago and got talking with somebody and hung out a little while and talked. And I'm like, man, I used to bartend in here. I used to be on the other side of the bar watching people do things that people are doing right now, but I'm not doing it anymore. But to be able to not be like, oh, no, I got, I'm sorry, I got to get out of here. I got, I got to go. Not because I got to get the pizza home, but because I'm very uncomfortable here. We need to be comfortable around sinners. Jesus was. He, he didn't stress them out. What was that? Amen. The friend of sinners. The friend of sinners. Okay. Coming in for a landing. Number three. Lengthen your cords. Lengthen your cords. Okay, I've got a tent. I've got the curtains that make up the tent. But now he's saying, I want you to, I want you to expand and enlarge the place of your tent. I want you to uh, stretch out the curtains. I'm talking again about expansion and enlargement. I want you to lengthen the cords. What is a cord? What's he talking about when he talks about cords? I'll just give you the verse in Ecclesiastes 4.12. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. As he talks about what? Relationships. Relationships. I share that a lot at a wedding. I've got a bride, I've got a groom, I've got Jesus. When he becomes the third cord in your covenant, it's going to be different than when it's just the two of you covenanting together because the state of New York says I need to. So when cords are mentioned, he's talking about relationships. Now God wants you to go a little bit further. He doesn't want you just to have pizza now and then. He wants you to establish relationship with people that are not just simply Christians. Relationship. It will not be koinonia because they don't have the Holy Spirit. But he wants us also to have relationships. He wants, he wants people to say, those people over there, they're my neighbors. They go to that church. But I'll tell you what, when we've had a need, they've been here. Yeah, we get together and hang out with them. We go out to dinner together. We, we uh, you know, go to a movie together. We, whatever the case might be. And they're not saved, but you've established a relationship with them. I mean, to say this in some churches, they'd be like, oh my gosh, do you hear what he's saying? That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to have relationships. 
and not be like, oh my gosh, I can only have relationships with the body of Christ. No, you can only have kingdom relationships with the body of Christ. You can only have the threefold cord with the body of Christ. But with other people, man, we need to get to know them. We need to know their birthdays. We need to know their kids' birthdays. We need to send them some. We need to invite them to our birthday parties when we have. We need to. I'm just telling you, if we're coming into a time of harvest and the church just continues to be what we have been, we're going to miss the harvest. It's coming. There's nothing you and I can do about it. But we're going to miss the... There are going to be people with hearts that are going to want to know about eternity, but they don't know where to go, and we're going to pass them in the night, and it's not going to be a connection for revelation and truth to flow. Okay. Okay. Strengthen your stakes is the last one. So I've got my relation. I got my I got my relationships. I got my cords. I've got my curtains, which are my boundaries. Everything's here is about enlargement. Everything here is about expansion. Everything here is about getting getting bigger. Strengthen your stakes, though. He says that's an important thing. When you're enlarging, when you're moving out, when you're making it bigger, it's important that your stakes are strengthened. Because the bigger the curtain gets, when the wind blows, the more apt for it to catch the wind and take off. So it's important when we do that to to make sure our stakes are strengthened. A stake speaks of three things. It speaks of support. It speaks of sharpen. You need to have a sharp stake, right? We always sharpen them to get them down in. and, And they're there to be set. A stake is not something that we move around a lot. We set it. When it's time to move the tent, that's one thing. But when I want it to be there, I, I want to set those stakes. The fourth thing is, so let me give you the three and then I'll add the fourth. Go places that you normally by habit would not go. Step outside your comfort zone, number two. Make real life connections with folks outside of your normal sphere, number three. And number four, deepen your commitment to the body of Christ. Because if you don't do that, when the winds blow, you might end up blowing down the road with it. If you're going to go places you normally wouldn't go, if you're going to be with people you normally wouldn't be with, you've got to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Because you're going to run into people sometimes that are extremely good at what they do. They're extremely confident. They can give you the data, the facts, the information. They'll talk you, you know into becoming a liberal in a heartbeat. Not today they won't, but if I spend too much time out there, if I start looking at places, you know, I I, I look and read from all kinds of sources. I want to find out what's going on out there today. I want to find out what's happening with, you know, through different venues. But at the same time, I spend 10 times as much time in the Word and 10 times as much time in a conservative biblical input as I do those other things. Those other things are simply informative to me. I want to be able to carry on a conversation in an environment. Deepen your commitment. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of their God. You need to be planted in the house. I know I'm preaching to the choir today, but I'm just saying this. It's not about attending a church. It's about getting planted in the house. Okay, a stake laying on the ground with a cord tied to it isn't going to do you a bit of good. It's got to be driven into the ground. It's got to be planted so you can flourish in the courts of your God. Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of a friend. How do I stay sharp? How do I stay sharp in my relationship with the Lord? How do I stay sharp in my walk with the Lord? It's through the body of Christ, through the body. My relationship with Jesus, but with his body, not just him as the head. We sharpen one another. We fellowship together. When we get together, it's not just about fun. It's fun, but we come together to get in the Word. We come together to challenge one another. We come together to, what's that word say to you anyhow? We come together, hey, do you want to, you know, can we go down, let's go down and visit uh, the Dillons this weekend or next time we have time so we can go and hang out with. It's that kind of a thing, okay? Deepening your commitment to the body of Christ. But now God has set members, each of them in the body, just as he pleased him. God has set us into the place. God has given you a calling. God has given you gifts. God has called you to a place. And God has set you in that place. No more. The tabernacle no longer. It's the temple. 
The temple's not movable. Once they came into the promised land, once you come into the promise of your walk with God, he sets you someplace and plants you right there so you can flourish in the courts of your God. And I'll finish with this here. <clears throat> Verse 3 says this, For you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. I'm listening today about the things that are going on in the world. Of course, we know gas prices. There's some things none of us need to get told about. Food prices, everything prices going crazy. War, drugs, murder, guns, abortion. I mean, it's like we're being inundated today with negativity, right? Or am I the only one that's drawn this conclusion? Absolutely. Negativity. Sometimes people in the church, and I, I read some of these things, it's doomsday. It's the end of the world. The rapture is coming soon. I had a guy the other day, not personally that I knew, but I listened to him. He couldn't figure out why the rapture hadn't come already. And I'm like, really? But anyhow, things are horrible. Crisis with food. Just all of this stuff. And if we're not careful, we can find ourselves reacting and responding to that kind of information. Is it true? The answer to that is yes. Those things are all happening. But at the same time, and this is so God, when the world is crying one thing, that's the time that God kicks in and does something just opposite. Just the opposite. When, when the conclusion of the church in many cases is, okay, we need to pull back. We need to, uh, you know, we really need to, we need to change our budget. We need to, you know, do this. And, and I'm not, I, I'm not, we, we always have to hear about Scripture and what it is about God's time. There's a time to gather and there's a time to let go. All of those seem to be, people would read Ecclesiastes and they go, what? This isn't telling me anything. It's saying there's a time for everything. And it's true. That's why I need to know what God's time is. God is saying it's time to expand. God is saying it's time to move out. God is saying time is time to reach out. Oh, but I think in this day with the finances and everything the way they are, I think I got to kind of, we got to kind of haul it in. Boy, we'd like to reach out to our neighbors, but we haven't got the money to do so. Boy, we'd like to do this, but I really don't have the finances. Boy, I'd like to do this, but I just, it's so crazy right now. You have to pray and do what God tells you to do, but I'm telling you, I think God's saying it's time to expand. It's time to step out. It's time to do the opposite of what the world is flipping out and telling everybody they need to do because that's what the Holy Ghost is saying to do. And as we do that, there's going to be a harvest. And as he says here again, as we ended, he said, don't, I'm sorry, verse 4, don't fear for you will, I'm sorry, uh, do not fear for you will not be ashamed, neither disgraced, you will not be put to shame. Where am I? I'm in the... It's not the verse I want. Oh, I'm sorry, three. You shall expand to the right and the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations. That's still what God's doing. There's a kingdom that's coming down. There's a kingdom that's going up. This is the kingdom of God. This is the kingdoms of this world. Don't get caught up in the mentality of this, or as a believer, you'll do this. Get caught up in the word of the Lord, because his provision will always be there for his people. Even when this is coming down, that which God is doing will be taking you up. That's just the way it is. That's one of the things that causes the world to look and say, man, I, what's going on here? And you say, well, it's just the Lord. It's just the Lord. What does it mean to expand? Finishing right here. Expansion and favor will increase to the church. It means to open, to spread, to diffuse, to enlarge, and to extend. They had favor with all the people. 
in Acts chapter 2. It was a tough time. It was a difficult time in Israel. And yet what the church was doing, breaking bread, apostles' doctrine, prayer, they're doing this stuff, they're hanging out with each other, they're having other people come, and it says, and there was favor upon them, and the Lord added daily those that were being saved. Because there was a there was a, 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 a people who were observing God's hand on the church. And they couldn't deny that God's hand was on the church for provision when what was going on in their community was everything was falling apart. We can't be afraid to be those people. We can't feel that, well, it's, it's all, you know, it's all going to hit. I'm telling you, God's provision is going to be there if I'm walking in the will of God. If I am expanding my tent, if I am stepping outside my comfort zone, if I am, it's not just because you're a Christian. It's when I'm being a Christian, when I'm being what God wants me to be. Acts chapter 8. Do you remember when Philip came preaching the gospel to Samaria? And it said that when he came to Samaria, he began to preach the gospel and great joy filled that city. We've already seen favor in Alfred in many ways. Just talking to Desmond about it yesterday a little bit about what is said about the lighthouse now, 40 years later. A lot of positive things are said. We've been through years of a lot of negative things said. When someone comes and applies for a position up there and somehow, you know, a lot of people will say, hey, I don't want them to know I'm a Christian. I just want, I'll tell you what, in Alfred right now, if you've been part of the lighthouse and, and you're functioning as a as as an employer or an employee, I'm sorry, and working hard and doing all those things you should do, there's favor on the church. There's favor on it. But there's going to be more. I don't want just favor. I just don't want people saying good things about us. I believe there's open hearts to hear the gospel, and God wants us to be the ones to take it out. Let's stand this morning. Amen. Take these four things and pray together and ask God, God, <clears throat> show me. And don't get too spiritual. If you don't get a picture of somebody, just start with your neighbors. Start on both sides of your house. Start with the people you work with. Start with them, but begin to enlarge your dwelling, which is involving people in my life. Thank you, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just ask, Lord God, every one of us, there are people that you have ordained that everyone in this room would touch for Christ. We're the vessel. We are the body of Christ. We are your hands. We are your feet. We are those, Lord God, whom you want. Our kiss, our hug, our handout, our helping hand, whatever it is, you want that to be you, but it's going to be us. It's a time of harvest. The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Lord, we do not want to be, we want to be laboring in what it is that you're doing. If you're here this morning as we close and you're hearing what I'm saying, but you know that God has been speaking to you personally through the message. And you want to Respond to the call of God, the challenge of God to enlarge your tent and what that, all the dynamics of what that means that goes way beyond what I've even said this morning. I want to ask that while we're closing here this morning that you would just simply come up here and stand because I want to pray over all of us. I don't think individually. I just want to, as I close, but I, but I want to, I, I, I'm sensing the need for a response this morning. For a response. Yeah, I want to be this person. I want to. I don't know, I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but I want to. We want to. Our family, we want to enlarge our tent. We want to expand. We want to begin to go places and reach out and do things that uh, we haven't done yet and before. 
I may have felt like I was, but this morning I realized there's more. If that's you while we're closing this morning, I just ask that you just come and stand. And I believe that there's an impartation that God wants to bring by the Holy Spirit this morning. Impartation is an interesting thing. It, it doesn't require a touch. It doesn't come verbally necessarily. It doesn't come, um, uh, you know, because I heard, a, I, I know those four points and I wrote them down. It's just something that God's hand touches you because you responded to an invitation. I can't say how many times I've responded to an invitation. I didn't even know what I was looking for, but when I, when I, when I went home and when I got out uh, in the car or whatever, or a day or two later, I, I felt like, you know, I think something happened when I did that. It's a response. Christian, go ahead, bro. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. We'll just lift our voices and worship Him for a moment here. Oh, praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Father. As I come into your presence. Yes. Past the gates I pray. Into to your sanctuary. sanctuary standing face, face to face. of praise into your sanctuary until we stand there face to face I look upon the countenance I see the fullness of your grace I can only bow down and say you are awesome you are awesome in this place Mighty God, you are awesome in this place. Our oh, Father, you are worthy of our praise. To you our lives we raise. You are. in this place mighty God you are awesome in this place Abba Father you are worthy of our praise to you our lives we raise you are mighty God you are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. Well, Lord, here we are. Here we are, and I, I'm just hearing the response, here am I, send me. Lord, we've come to this little spot here in the front of the church. And I, I, I sense that we're all feel, feeling challenged in this area. And yet, somewhere inside each one of us that's responded here, we know that this is true. I, I believe there are those that have even sensed it themselves. And maybe this morning put some definition. I don't know. But God, here we are saying, Lord, we, we know we can't do this ourselves. But at the same time, I believe you have positioned us, me as an individual, my friends, my relationships, my husband, my wife, our children, the business that we're in, the place that we work, whatever it is, I believe that you've positioned us to be a, a light in a dark place, to, to bring a, a flow of the Spirit. There are healings in store. There are the gifts of the Spirit you want to energize in each one of us. 
the gifts of the Spirit. Not just to say, oh, I had hands laid on me one time and they said that I had the gift of... Man, forget about that. What is in you? The, if the gift of God is in you, He's in there saying things, doing things, moving. Lord, we just want to be what You want us to be. Thank You for Your blessing and provision. Don't ever let me look at Your provision as if it's just for me. But Lord, when there's increase, that's another sign that it's time to go spread the good news. And so, Lord, have your way with us, in us, and through us. And we thank you again today. We're so thankful for what you're doing in our lives. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Lord, let the anointing of the Holy Spirit fall in this place on each one of us right now. The anointing of the Holy Spirit for the glory of God. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. Praise God.